Welcome to the Hudson Institute. I'm Brian Clark, a senior fellow at the Institute and director of the Hudson Center for Defense Concepts and Technology. Uh, we are honored today to have with us Congresswoman Elaine Luria from uh, Virginia's second congressional district uh, for a discussion about the new maritime strategy or implementing a new maritime strategy. Uh, Congresswoman Luria has been in Congress for, since 2018. Uh, she has already risen through the ranks, is the vice chairman of the uh, House Armed Services uh, Committee and uh, also is on the, mem she's a member of the um, Veterans Affairs Committee where she's chair of the Disability Assistance and Memorial Affairs uh, Subcommittee. She's also in the House Committee for Homeland Security. Uh, she served for two decades in the Navy prior to coming to Congress, which we can all appreciate. Um, and she is actually the longest serving member uh, of the military that's in the Democratic Caucus. Uh, the, uh, so uh, Representative Luria, before she, uh, she re retired from the Navy, uh, served on six ships as a nuclear trained surface officer. Uh, and also deployed to the Middle East and to the Western Pacific. She culminated by commanding a uh, combat unit of uh, 400 sailors. Uh, Representative Lurie was one of the first women to uh, be in the Navy's nuclear power program, uh, of which I am also a graduate, as well as several people here. Uh, and uh, is one of, among the, one of the first women to serve her entirety of her career on combatant ships. Uh, she's a graduate of the US Naval Academy uh, and has a master's degree from Old Dominion University. Uh, and we appre really appreciate you being here tonight. So thank you for coming, Congresswoman Luria. <laughs> yes, definitely. And um, it's great to have a live audience so we can actually get some questions from naval experts as well as the media. Uh, so to start off with, the, the genesis of this conversation was an article you wrote in the, uh, the uh, Center for uh, Mar International Maritime Security's uh, website mm -hmm. uh, talking about uh, the need for a new maritime strategy. Um, so why do you think we need a new maritime strategy, and uh, what do you think some of the major elements of it should be? And then we'll talk about sort of what we do if maybe we're not able to get our, our, you know, uh, our aspirations met there. Well, it's kind of a long trajectory to get to the point of, of writing this article. And I guess the immediate part before it was I felt like, you know, there's a lot of times I just keep saying there's a problem, but I haven't really said, you know, maybe this is a potential solution. So I started looking for other work. And, you know, I did cite a CSBA study that you were involved in from a few years earlier as, you know, some of the elements of that could, could lead to a potential strategy. But really going back to when I first came to Congress and my first cycle through the NDAA, you know, it's all new the first time that as a member of Congress. And, you know, listening to um, the services, the combatant commanders come before us and explain, you know, this is what's in our budget request but really not explaining why. Like, there was no real strategy behind it. And, you know, so, so asking those types of questions and realizing that, you know, although I served in the Navy, I understand the difference between a cruiser or a destroyer, the function of a carrier strike group, the different types of aircraft we had, the range of a Tomahawk missile. Like, my colleagues, they don't understand any of that. And this is all just numbers and figures to them. So why isn't there any sort of strategy to really be able to be compelling to people and say, like, look, this is what's happening in the Pacific, and this is why we need more ships, and this is why we need to do the shift to the Pacific, and this is why you know, we need these forces. There's really nothing out there like that. And then you know, kind of looking back on, on the 600-ship Navy, you know, I thought to myself, well, you know, we used to have a strategy. There used to be a very clear, compelling way um, to explain that this is what we needed as a nation and to counter the Soviet threat. And you know, Secretary Lehman, um, you know, clearly explained we needed these forces in the North Atlantic, the Mediterranean, the Western Pacific, it all added up, it was 600 ships. And then the more I, I researched it and, and actually spoke to some of the people who helped write the, the maritime strategy in the 1980s, you know, the 600 ships actually existed before Lehman became secretary, but it really gained that momentum and truly it gained the support of the administration and the president. Um, and I would say that, you know, that's something we're still working on today um, to make sure to have that, that kind of impetus. Um, but then trying to understand, well, what's different today? And it all came back to, well, you know, the strategy went away when Goldwater Nichols came around. And independent from that, I had also been thinking to myself, well, you know, we're going up on about 35 years since Goldwater Nichols has been implemented. And not initially focused just on this maritime strategy piece of it, but did Goldwater Nichols really achieve what we thought it should achieve from its instigation? And so I started having conversations with other colleagues. Um, other people, you know, who, who focus on, on these types of issues about, you know, what would it take to do some sort of re-examination of Goldwater Nichols and then also peeling back, <laughs> realizing that there's been lots of hearings in Congress about this. I mean, one, I think it was 2015, Michelle Flournoy came before Congress and gave a very extensive um, perspective on some things that needed to be changed about Goldwater Nichols. 
And so putting all those pieces together, I mean, it, it kind of became clear that when Goldwater Nichols happened, the naval strategy was dead. And there really is no long-term vision um, as far as strategy for the Navy. And the real truth of it is, is that, you know, I think that strategy has to come before requirements, before POM, before the budget, and we're doing it all backwards. Um, and so when we look at, and, and then I started to say, well, okay, we have this Battle Force 2045, and even before that came out, I was looking at, you know, how the Navy is justifying these force structure assessments that are coming forward. And so I, you know, did what I do and, you know, made a few calls around Norfolk and, and got some documents that, you know, went over and, and read the, you know, the base documents for, for the different things like the FSFA and to try to understand what are the assumptions. Like you have to have inputs to get the output. So what are the inputs? What assumptions were made? And came quickly to learn that the input wasn't a no plan or a strategy. The input was a lot of other things. Um, it, it made assumptions that this is the top line we're going to get, and that's all we're going to get. So I felt like they're already coming in constrained. They assume this is the only top line they're going to get. And so using that as a mindset, coming out with, like, this is the best we can get. For, this is the best we can do for the money you're going to give us. Rather than coming to Congress and saying, you know, I don't want to use expletives, but no blank. There's a real problem in the Pacific. We need more resources. We need more focus here. This is why this is important. And like, this is what we, this is what we actually need. And I've gone back to the CNO multiple times. I was like, are you going to come, this time when you come for the hearing, are you going to come tell us what you actually need? Um, and you know, I think that the structure and you know, the different roles of the, the service secretaries and the service chiefs, they aren't really in a position to do that. And there's not a strategy that's a vehicle for them to advocate for that. So they're just constrained by things like this is the only top line we're going to get. And also, they make assumptions going in that we're going to operate on a rotational basis using something similar to the Optimized Fleet Response Plan, the OFRP. And I think all of us in this room who followed this know that the OFRP has gotten us to a five-to-make-one model. Um, not that long ago, we were on a four-to-make-one. And if you go all the way back to the 80s with the John Lehman strategy, we were at a three-to-make-one. So then I started asking questions, well, what if we can get back this direction? What if we can just get back to four to make one? And so instead of every question we have about investments in the newest, shiniest object, the new ship class, we made investments in the things that could actually get us back to four to make one, and you could increase the effective size of the Navy by doing that. Um, so and this is a very long-winded answer, but it kind of it's, a com it's like a culmination of like sort of three NDAA cycles of going through this and seeing how they come to Congress with essentially, we're constrained, but this is the best we can ask for with what you're giving us. And then this year, it was just sort of the, it was a huge disappointment to see that, you know, they came with a budget that essentially proposed only building one destroyer, decommissioning more ships than they're building this year. Um, and I thought, you know, just really missed the mark and that led me, in addition to the article you're talking about, I did a, an op-ed that, that, that was shared in the Wall Street Journal about the say-do gap. Because I felt like every service chief, every service secretary, um, for the ones we had, granted, you know, no confirmed Navy secretary still over 200 days into the administration, um, that, that they were saying, China is our number one threat. We need to do everything possible. Every resource we have needs to go towards dealing with, with, with China. And also, you know, Russia and also cyber. But, but China, and then I'm like, if that's the case, you have to have ships and aircraft to do that, but you're cutting more than you're building. So it didn't, it didn't make any sense. And so I thought to myself, you know, rather than just continuing to identify the problem, I'll just throw something out there to start the conversation. <laughs> I mean, I certainly didn't think what I wrote in a, a seven or eight page article was going to you know, be the solution, right. but it took elements of work like you had done previously with your colleagues and just basically said, we could do more with what we have right. by changing how we deploy it, how we focus on, you know, where we put those ships and aircraft. And then also, you know, really for somewhat minor, I mean, I hate to say minor, I mean, the scale we're talking about of budgets is right. astronomical, but, you know, percentage-wise, yeah. a, 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 I won't say nominal because in respect yeah. that it is a lot of money, but for, you know, a, a specific amount of money, about 5% more to the defense budget, about $10 billion a year, we could start making significant progress right. towards this. And, you know, it was really meant to start the conversation <laughs> and have room full of people who work right. on these kind of things all, all, all day, every day, um, and would love to hear thoughts and feedback on, on that. Uh, you bet. And then, um, so one of the things that really intrigued me about the article was this focus on, you know, trying to do 
more with what we already have. Try, you know, the, the idea behind a maritime strategy might be to indicate where we want to go in the future in terms of how we want to deal with China and then maybe some inkling of how we're going to fight, how will we address the Chinese threat when it actually manifests itself uh, to get to some of Admiral Davidson's concerns about the, mm -hmm. the time frame in which that might happen. Um, and I like the fact that the article was really look, looking at uh, initiatives that could be started within the next few years that would mm -hmm. be actually able to come to fruition in the time frame that Admiral Davidson identified of you know, six mm -hmm. or seven years, sometime this decade. Um, and, and a couple of those things were this, you know, increase in the operational tempo to get a greater operational availability, which would require us to have the infrastructure to support that, um, both from the training perspective as well as the maintenance perspective. Um, what, are some, what are some of the other things that you think we need to do to be able to kind of bring up the level of naval capability and capacity within this uh, window that Admiral Sid Davidson has identified, which is essentially between now and 2030, mm -hmm. um, which is really sh shorter time frame than we would be able to address through modernization. Yeah. This is like I've been saying, Battle Force 2045, you know, came out very right. close to the end of the last administration. It was very ambitious, but you know, we also need to focus on 2025, yeah. you know, the near term. And so the, you know, the things you mentioned, and I, I appreciate the fact that, you know, we have really stressed our forces recently in the last year and a half in the sense that we got ourselves tied back down in the Gulf again, mm -hmm. essentially the Gulf, the Middle East region. And even going further back than that, I mean, for the last 20 years, we have mm -hmm. used the Navy as a power projection force, right. you know, offshore power projection force, carrier strike group launching mm -hmm. strikes into mm -hmm. Iraq and Afghanistan, tomahawk shooters yeah. supporting those efforts. And really everything that the Navy did was focused on supporting those land-based activities right. in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then also I think that let us atrophy some of these capabilities. Um, you know, we didn't really practice or utilize the anti-submarine warfare, the anti-air warfare. I mean, we had an air warfare commander defending the carrier, but defending right. the carrier from what? Right. Um, you know, you, you were in the Gulf and you had the P3 that came out every now and then. It was not a seriously right. complex <laughs> right. target, right? Um, but so, and I think, you, you know, kind of losing that focus on those other warfare areas that we're focusing right. on now with a different type of, you know, yeah. competitor, um, or a potential future adversary in the Pacific, you know, we didn't prioritize the types of platforms that would continue mm -hmm. along yeah. that path of being able to maintain those capabilities. So, you know, we didn't ever build a replacement to the cruiser. Mm -hmm. We came up with the DDG-X, the DDG-1000. Right. We were supposed to build 32 of them. We only built three, and then we abandoned the main weapons right. system on that platform. The LCS was supposed to be able to provide some of these capabilities. We all know the modular nature mm -hmm. of that, the MIME warfare, the ASW, Modules still not deployed, um, even though I do think that that ship can be utilized for some lower end right. missions, especially the speed and the shallow draft could make it very beneficial in certain areas, mm -hmm. you know, in the Pacific, especially dealing with, um, you know, smaller mm -hmm. island nations mm -hmm. where we need to be present. Um, but, you know, so we let a generation go by without building ships to replace our older ships right. for these capabilities. And kind of, you know, thinking as I was working on this article, you know, every ship I served on was designed and started to be built in response to the Cold War. Right. You know, my first ship yep. was a DD. Um, then I served on a DDG. I was the XO of a cruiser later, served on a couple carriers. One of them, Enterprise, was still along, around for, for most <laughs> of that time. Um, but, you know, we really didn't modernize our weapon systems and our platforms yeah. to today's adversary. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, things that we can do today, one is, first of all, you have to have ships. You have to have mm -hmm. platforms. So the idea of decommissioning ships right. before you're building okay. replacements is problematic. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a strong advocate of, you know, not decommissioning seven cruisers. And you'll see over the NDAA cycle, I think there'll be a fight over mm -hmm. that. But this is not the first time it's happened over the cruisers, yeah. exactly for the reason we didn't build anything right. to replace them. Um, I think that the way that we deploy our ships is important. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned that we've been very stressed, especially recently. The OFRP, so you took a carrier strike group deployment from six out of every 24 months. That's the old original fleet response plan. Then the OFRP, six out of every 36. So you went from 25% deployed to 17% deployed. So you effectively you know, reduced mm -hmm. the, the, the right. force by an entire carrier strike group. Um, but by doing that, um, you, know, you, you built in this surge time frame. Right. And to me, <laughs> Surge always meant extra capability, right. an extra ship ready to go, <laughs> you know, trained, ready to go um, in the time of crisis. But what Surge has really meant is Surge is a ship deploying to replace another ship that's right. in maintenance. And, you know, without going too far into the weeds of it, one time a couple years ago, I guess it was the first year I was, I was in Congress, I was driving across the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, and I see three carriers at Naval Station Norfolk. I had just been at Norfolk Naval Shipyard the week before, CVN 77s in the dry dock for 
27 months. Yeah. Um, and I, we all know the delays that have been encountered on the Ford. So I'm thinking to myself, there are five carriers in Norfolk right now that cannot deploy for a variety of reasons, all because of maintenance. Um, so the 72 was, no, the 73 was being refueled. The 74 was already in port, not deploying because it was waiting to be refueled. Um, and then the others that I mentioned. And, you know, so we really haven't been able to use the OFRP as a way to increase additive capacity. We've just really used it to make up for other right. ships. And so you've seen double deployments of Truman. You've seen double deployments of Ike and TR mm -hmm. as well over the last, you know, year and a half, two years. And so we've gotten ourselves drawn back into the Gulf again. You know, first it was the what happened with those drones in the Saudi mm -hmm. oil fields and then the ship, the explosions that happened off mm -hmm. Fujaira, mm -hmm. and now the withdrawal from Afghanistan. So I, I think that this is one of the biggest mistakes that we have made, and I maybe in my lifetime, strategically to have taken the Reagan mm -hmm. from Westpac and sent them to be in support of the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Because going to my article, you have to have presence to create a deterrent. And if we do not show the resolve that we will keep a carrier, at a minimum, in the Pacific, that sends a terrible signal. Right. Um, and I think that, you know, I mean, obviously I, I lined up the multiple strike groups that, that had, you know, just double deployed. Um, and apparently that was the only option that they felt acceptable. And then how long are we tied down there? Right. Are we now tied down there again where we're going to have to have a carrier? Um, supporting the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. There's changes happening with our posture in Iraq. So, you know, are we still in a situation where the Navy just can't get free of the fact um, that they're tied down to supporting these land-based, you know, power projection right. roles or support to land forces? Um, and so that is, is problematic. So, you know, in an ideal world, <laughs> um, you know, you would have the ability to utilize the carrier's more, i.e. not tied down in these maintenance availabilities. Mm -hmm. With the Bush, CVN-77 being in the yards for 27 months, mm -hmm. and that happened because of submarine refueling overall, the MTS, mm -hmm. the more training ship conversion. So Norfolk Naval Shipyard basically got you know bogged down and priorities were made that the carrier was not the priority. Um, and so you know the cascading effect of that plus the other ones I mentioned. Um, but you know, I had long thought that, well, we have a carrier base in Japan, mm -hmm. and they operate on the FDNF mm -hmm. model with a two-thirds availability, mm -hmm. so like a 0. 0.67 presence right. per year. Why can't we do that with carriers based either elsewhere? That's difficult to get a carrier based elsewhere. But you can do it with a carrier based in the U.S. Like, why don't we have an East Coast and a West Coast FDNF carrier that for 10 years operate on this model of a 0. 0.67 mm -hmm. Um, and you know, you, you know, there's other ways to do that. You can sort of use an FDNF right. Kona space to, to increase your presence, your deployability, mm -hmm. and, and just operate them differently. So that fits in really well right. to the model in the CSBA study mm -hmm. where you talked about this maneuver force. Right. Um, you know, I am pleased to see at Fleet Forces, I talked to Admiral mm -hmm. Grady the other day and, and others about this, that they are looking to do this um, Operation Greyhound. So essentially mm -hmm. some destroyers yeah. on an FDNF-based model. Right. But getting back to like where we keep getting tied down with the Navy is like, look how we've gotten tied down with missile defense mm -hmm. now too. Mm -hmm. Four DDGs in Rota looking mm -hmm. to bring six. We have the DDGs in Westpac that are tied down in this missile defense role. Is that like, should that solely be the Navy's role? We have other things that these platforms are important right. for. And maybe just, you know, from a perspective of the Navy, without truly having a strategy to justify it, it's hard for Navy's leadership right. to fight for the fact that these ships actually really need to be doing other things. And I know I have a really long answer to this question, but I wanted to pause and say, like, I am not faulting this in any way on, like, today's current Navy leadership. I mean, this is decades right. of these decisions that were made that accumulated, like, where we are today. Um, so, you know, obviously don't envy. Um, the CNO or the incoming SECNAV, you know, in the yeah. position they're coming into, um, because I really think they're trying to do the best they can with what they have today. Right. But if they had a strategy, they'd have a lot better tool right. to advocate for what they really need. And, I'm, and it's interesting you brought that up. I wanted to take it back to strategy for a minute. Um, you, you, you've talked about some specific things that the Navy do, could do to improve its capability in the near term to address the China threat. Um, and a lot of that revolves around strategy, getting a strategy that the 
national leadership will buy into, you know, because if you have that buy-in on the part of the White House and on the part of the you know, SecDef to say, we're going to maintain presence in Indo-PACOM and we're going to accept risk in other theaters, even if that means we can't deploy Reagan over to CENTCOM and we're going to have to come up with some other mechanism to provide that air cover for mm -hmm. the withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, or to deal with the challenges posed um, in Iraq against, you know, from um, Iranian, Iranian supported militias. Right. Um, that'd be a strategic decision. Um, the, um, so when you, when you talk about a strategy, you talked in the article about a kind of a deterrence-based strategy focusing on maximizing our, our mm -hmm. presence and maintaining our presence over in um, the Far East to be able to, to address the China threat. Um, and you talked about these as being some elements of it. So you saw posture as being a major element of it. So maybe looking at forward basing as well, increasing our forward basing. Um, what, do you, what do you see as kind of the Navy's how would the Navy, what's the Navy's role in this deterrence of China? Do you see it as primarily there to deny a Chinese attempt to take a territory away from one of our allies? Do you see it primarily there to you know, cause friction and you know, impact their Chinese decision-making uh, processes to try to dissuade them from even going down the road of conflict? Uh, do you see them as you know, being there to kind of protect the Places that the Air Force is operating from. I mean, there's a lot of ways to think about what the you know, what are the major moving you know kind of the major moving parts of that strategy. So, I mean, I think that they do all of the above by being there, and I think they just they have to be there to start with. Um, you know, I think that you know if you're going to have a deterrent presence, mm -hmm. it needs to be credible. Like they need to know that it is going to be there. Um, and I think you know in the article I described, you know, you could kind of. Do basing, and you know we're we're not talking about a large number of platforms, um, but almost like in an arc um, from mm -hmm. Djibouti to Diego Garcia to Singapore to Guam, you know, mm -hmm. to Japan. You have a carrier strike group in the Pacific, but like it's up in Yokosuka, right? right? Um, and other than you know being underway and in, in, in the general area, but like I think that being present in a way that they know you're there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I really do applaud the, this administration for the fact that, you know, trying to lean in on allies and partners. Mm -hmm. And right. the fact that the British are deploying mm -hmm. their carrier to the Western Pacific, I think, is, is wonderful. Right. Um, and then have also announced that they will have some ships that are maintained presence right. there permanently. Um, the French, for example, I mean, 93% of their exclusive economic zone is in the Indo-PACOM AOR, and mm -hmm. they already have naval right. bases and ships right. there. We should be operating with them more. There's obviously the Quad um, countries as well from India, you know, Australia, Japan, South Korea. We have a lot of allies in the region. So I think that our deterrence, you know, we need to be present and operating with mm -hmm. those allies. But, you know, I think that it it could be more deliberate. And right. I was stationed at 7th Fleet, and I understand, you know, at 7th Fleet, the N7, you know, they have tasking to make sure we mm -hmm. do theater square cooperation right. with certain countries. But, like, I think from just a really, you know, a COCOM level in conjunction with the State Department, kind of like in every, you know, um, level of government um, perspective of, you know, what does it mean to have our naval forces there? Right. I mean, I think that... And, and I really haven't seen, you know, since my time in Congress mm -hmm. specifically, that maybe there's not enough coordination between the State Department and the Navy as far mm -hmm. as, like, the idea of naval diplomacy. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all know the ship goes and does a port visit somewhere. You host a reception. You bring local leaders on board. You show some influence. Sailors spend a lot of money in port. Hopefully don't get in too much trouble while they're <laughs> on liberty. Um, but, you know, I mean, th th these things may seem, you know, superficial to the outside right. observer, but, like, that sort of diplomatic influence and presence is very important. And I know that happens. I mean, mm -hmm. I know that the attaches meet with the right. Indo-PACOM commander and they have a plan. Um, but I truly think that the presence in a way that the, the Chinese, they have a real doubt in their mind mm -hmm. all the time um, as to what we could do and where. Right. And then our presence of being there, it's almost like closing the door to prevent other people right. from coming in. Um, so I think that, you know, even relatively small investments in some of these mm -hmm. these countries, you know, some of the smaller island nations, um, for things like schools and infrastructure projects and, you know, vaccinations mm -hmm. and, you, you know, like it bolstering those allies mm -hmm. to make sure that they want to come to the U.S., right. that they want to work with the U.S., and that they don't want the Chinese there is right. very important. So it's multifaceted, mm -hmm. but I think the truth is, is you have to be there and you right. have to always be there. So a right. deterrent that leaves, yeah. like we have today, is is problematic. Right.
Right, you gotta be present to, to be yeah. able to participate. Uh, which gets, gets back to um, you know, the role of, of some other naval combatants. I mean, I think you know, when you go talk to folks in like OPNAV and they talk about the analysis that they've done, the analysis we did for the future naval force structure study last year, very focused on hard power, very focused on you know, can you win a kinetic set of engagements mm -hmm. against the PLAN, um, which you know, is you know, obviously relevant at a certain point. But it sounds like what you're talking about as a strategy that also incorporates this element of dissuasion. You know, can we mm -hmm. convince the Chinese that the environment is not really hospitable to them because there's a lot of allies that are going to, mm -hmm. you know, gang up on them in a multilateral way, um, which can be done diplomatically or, or through other economic or other means. Um, so, do we need to think about deploying uh, having our smaller surface combatants, our LCS, um, you know, maybe looking at the um, the maritime sea lift command ships as being a, a more important element of mm -hmm. this of a maritime strategy um, than we might give them credit for being today because certainly you know we tend yeah, to I, think yeah. of the lcs as this afterthought that we wish we'd never done but there seems to be a huge opportunity over there yeah. to practice naval diplomacy using a platform like that along with our mm -hmm. civilian manned ships no i definitely agree on both of those fronts i also think you know the coast guard has done an excellent mm -hmm. job the Berthold deployed right. recently or Berthoff, um mm -hmm to um, the Western Pacific, and there is a lot of opportunity for our smaller, you know, we call lower end, like lower end right. weapon system platforms to play right. a big role within the region. Um, so, you know, although I think the frigate is, you know, a good program moving forward, we kind right. of built like a two-third size DDG. Right. <laughs> um, instead of like a frigate with a lower right. end capability. And I think that decision was made because once you said, well, this thing operating in the Pacific is going to have to have this type of air defense and kind of all yeah. of these high end capabilities, right. same as a, a DDG or a cruiser would mm -hmm. today, but just a smaller, small and less draft. Um, you know, so the Navy just has never been really good about investing in kind of their lower right. end, most basic right. platforms that can provide some, I think, real benefit um, in some areas. Um, of the world. So there may be an opportunity there too, looking at what the, the Navy's thinking of doing with the large unmanned surface vessel. If that were a manned combatant, you know, which is something we've advocated for, is you know thinking about that maybe as being a really small surface combatant that's manned most of the time. Um, that might be another platform that we could use for this naval diplomacy that can transition to a, a wartime, you know, mm -hmm. contribution. Um, maybe I mean, but but we need to look at what we can do today. I mean, if we're yeah. gonna, I just I can't reemphasize enough my opinion that we we can't divest of everything we have right. today just for the hopes that we're going to have some oh, yeah. technology 20 or 30 years down the road because right. we haven't had a great track record right. you know with developing new systems mm -hmm. with a lot of new technologies and like we just have to be there today we have right. to have the ships and we have to be there and we have to be present and i, I mean i understand the cha challenges mm -hmm. of the fact of you know their weapons ranges versus ours you know how close can you get i mean i'm, I'm not deaf right. to that right. but they're truly you have to be there. You right. can't just walk away, and right. if you don't have platforms, you can't be there. Um, so, yeah. I think we focus too much on the one v one capability right. of particular right. weapon systems versus the tactics and what can we do to, to sort of disrupt their thought process. And Michelle Fournoy is, you know, very simple. In seventy two hours, they should know that we can credibly, you know, um, threaten all of their, you know, um, defenses. So. Um, the answer is, you know, I'm, I'm, I haven't really been a big fan of unmanned. Right. I'm fine with some modest investments mm -hmm. in developing the technology for down right. the road, but I think we need to take a mature technology. Like, we right. can build the hulls. I mean, these small ships, they're maybe like OSBs mm -hmm. or something, yeah. not that big, not that complicated right. to build. But, but, you know, you've operated a ship before. Can right. you imagine a ship crossing the Pacific not manned right. with, like, no one, right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> ship clean and inspect the lube oil strainer? I mean, right. like, how does a ship <laughs> operate that long right. at sea with no intervention? It, it doesn't seem practical to me. And, and if they're trying to make leaps to some completely new, you know, mechanical systems, that has problems right. as well. Like, we have some tested mechanical systems, diesels, and the types of equipment we've used for decades. Right. And the ship classes that we went through, you know, previously were all an evolution of each other. You know, you started with yep. the DD, then you took the same hull and put a new weapon mm -hmm. system and superstructure on it for the cruiser. Then you took that weapon system mm -hmm. and put it on a new hull for the DDG, and then you've continued to evolve right. that. And as long as we've done an evolutionary process, mm -hmm. we've had a lot more success than right. just Starfish, 50 new yeah. technologies and a new hull and right. starting from scratch. So. 
Right, yeah, definitely. Um, so I want to uh, turn over and get some questions from the audience <laughs> <laughs> um, to um, you know, kind of uh, leaven the, uh, the conversation here. And I know there, there probably are some questions. So if you have a question, um, think about what you might ask, and you know, please raise your hand, and we'll bring your microphone around to you. Um, and while these guys are deliberating, and gals, um, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, um, in terms of you know, new technologies, you know, unmanned obviously has a lot of challenges because it does. It's a new platform that you've got. To, the con ops are also very difficult for it. Um, but there's some other technologies that we might want, to, might want to pursue in the near term. So you know, mission systems, weapons, new sensors. Um, there's a there's a real concern on the part of na some Navy leadership about the reliance on um, active monostatic radars. You know, as as the as a major component of our sensing network, mm -hmm. and the fact that we need to go towards you know, more distributed sensors or rely on space or rely on land-based UAVs like the MQ-4. Um, do we need to evolve the sensor network that we're going to use? Because I think in the near term, that's even going to be problematic. So even mm -hmm. if we have the presence, um, the Chinese might feel like they can engage all of our targets or all of our, you know, uh, mm -hmm. platforms pretty quickly because they're all going to be radiating and, and mm -hmm. you know, doing things that make them more detectable. Um, do we need to think about a new strategy for sensing and for operating in the spectrum to support uh, deterrence in the near term? I mean, I definitely think that we need to, you know, look at and develop the new technologies that are available for that. But like part of deterrent is being there and having people know you're there, right? right. So you don't go MCON Alpha and be a deterrent. Like you, you want people to know you're there. Right. Um, but maybe sometimes you don't want them yeah. to know you're there. Yeah. I mean, you kind of have the options on that. Um, but you know, I definitely do think as technology evolves, different types of you know sensors, and there's a lot of talk about you know networking, um, and the fact you know that networks are vulnerable, um, and that needing to develop this you know next generation of networks. I kind of look back at one of the last things that called itself a strategy, and they talked a lot about this thing called ForceNet. Right. Did ForceNet ever? <laughs> it was the the great network that was going to connect everything together, which. And then I asked someone in a, in a briefing recently, like, can you give me a status update on ForceNet? And like, they, didn't, they didn't know what I was talking about. It was like, it's you right could, here, 2007, I think it was. That's know. right. I think the Naval Transformation War Roadmap had a depiction of it in 2008. So <laughs> that was probably the last time anybody heard of it. Um, uh, for questions? Vago, do you have a question? I, I, I do. Um, Vago Moranian from Defense and Aerospace Report. Great conversation. Okay. Um, the Vice Chairman and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, John Hyten, on Monday, uh, made comments that I think for a lot of strategists were overdue, sort of a, the, sort of like the Alcoholics Anonymous, right? You, you have to start with admitting you have a problem before you fix it. Are you convinced, given what you've been briefed about the October War Game, that there is actually a shift in strategy and thinking in, in the Pentagon? Because there's this tendency, we hear this message but then there isn't really follow through, right? Somebody who's, especially at the end of their career, just before they retire, will throw the grenade, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, th there's, there's not mo much more. And I think in this case, we have to hear from the White House, the Defense Secretary. Do, are, you, are you getting a sense that there are needle moving, that, that folks recognize what you're basically saying and what John Hyten is saying in terms of the need to really change the way that we're doing this? Otherwise, we're just going to spend more money and not get anything. Um. Well, I would start by saying that I haven't had a brief on the October war game, the war game you're referencing, and I do think I saw the article that you're talking about that where he made some comments about this. So I definitely should, you know, attempt to get a, a brief to be more fully up to speed on that particular thing. Um, and I think you make a really good point about you know people at the end of their career they they have a vision and then they move on. There's not a continuity um, of a long-term vision to be able to develop these you know types of plans, whether it's a new fleet force structure, whether it's new weapon, uh, new weapon systems, new networks. And, you know, I think that an enduring strategy would, <laughs> would help tie that all together and like, let it continue past. I mean, it's really just been driven by personalities of CNOs mm -hmm. or secretaries of the mm -hmm. navies as to how effective they've been to get, you know, to make some advances in, in what, you know, their current goals are. I don't even want to say strategy because it's not really fitting into like a strategy of, of why they're yeah. doing what they're doing. Their ideas. Yeah. Um, but oftentimes the next person wants to come in and make a mark and they, they kind of take it in a different direction or rebrand the same thing. Um, but without a long-term enduring you know, strategy that everyone can be behind uh, from the administration down, um, I do find it, it challenging to have the right focus on these things, vulnerabilities like you described from this war game. 
it, so it's really, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that and then thinking about your earlier remarks uh, because the implication of the, the way that John Hyden and even the CNO talks about the, the way they intend to fight if they get into a conflict with China. It's very much focused on like, you know, project overmatch and it's all about networks and decision aids and being able to make rapid decisions and uh, coalesce fires around targets. It's very focused on, you know, what we would call like phase three of warfare, the, the high end conflict that, you know, is World War III and, and we got to prove the ability to win that. Um, and, it, and you're talking about a strategy that goes beyond that and thinks about, okay, what happened in all the years and months preceding that? Um, how do we, you know, prepare the, the, the battlefield? How do we try to avoid even getting to that situation where we're in the phase three? Is that, would that be, you know, in your mind, a strategy would really need to focus on those earlier phases mm -hmm. of the confrontation rather than being, you know, kind of boresighted on the fight itself? Mm -hmm. I definitely think so, and if we focus just on the fight ourselves, like I don't think any of us would sleep at night. Like I yeah. mean, we're, we're yeah. kind of falling behind on a lot of those capabilities, yeah. and you know, if they're you know anti-surface missiles can well outrange anything that we have. I mean, we haven't invested in a long-range anti-surface missile. Not that we didn't have the capability over right. the last two decades to develop that, but right. you know, all we have is harpoon, and essentially, you know, that hasn't changed. And for a while, yeah. we weren't even deploying ships with a full harpoon launcher, yeah. right? Like, and so. You know, I think that the idea that we're looking on, you know, long-range anti-surface missiles yeah. and, and developing those capabilities, but now we're kind of in a catch-up game of, like, right. developing the technology to keep up with the technology that, that, that they already have. Um, and so I think that it is kind of, you know, the, if you talk about phases, like the phase right. zero part of it, the, 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 the part where we can, you know, create a, a strategy, like a deterrent strategy in the theater and have, you know, like, really using the, mm -hmm. the structure that you did in the 2017 CSBA model was you have a deterrent force, right. but then you also have a maneuver force. And the maneuver force, you know, we're kind of getting back to my whole thought about gold yeah. or nickels, is I think we're very stovepiped right. in these geographic areas yep. of the combatant commanders. Um, and it became clear in discussions we had with three separate combatant commanders about the Arctic, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously the Pacific. I'm really pretty confused on the East Coast between yeah. Second Fleet and the new NATO Joint Command. Right. And UCOM, and when ships chop from Second Fleet to UCOM, and you know it's it's, it's very confusing. Yeah. I mean, you don't have a combatant commander. I mean, you used to have Atlantic Command, yeah, um, and that went away. Then we took fleet, Second Fleet away. We brought Second Fleet back. But anyway, the, the, these geographic lines mm -hmm. of the combatant commanders, and I see some people in the audience nodding. I just think it requires reexamination, right. along with quite a few other things in um, Goldwater Nichols. Um, so I don't know if I think I strayed from your initial question. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, so um, I, think you, I think you got there. Uh, that's a great point. So the um, the idea behind the maneuver force was that you would have a multi carrier force that is free to move basically all through mm -hmm. the Indo Pacific, even into CENTCOM. Uh, and the idea was to divorce that from being you know, uh, locked mm -hmm. down and, and uh, having to operate within a particular geographic constraint, so that you could have the ability for it to train and practice right. and do higher and the deterrent end force operations. itself doesn't necessarily. And in your model, it didn't either. It doesn't consist of aircraft carriers. Right. It doesn't right. consist of carrier strike groups. Um, you know, some different discussions and, and models and the force structures that were looked at, you know, use what would be called a light carrier, so a large yeah. deck amphib with some mm -hmm. fixed wing, you know, as a capability, you know, less than carrier, less sorties, but a capability that has a, a longer range. Um, but in the model that I described, you know, I, I kind of envisioned we've got to keep the carrier in Yakusco. Yeah. You've got to keep the FDNF carrier. That gives you a 0.67 presence. Then you can take an, an East Coast and a West Coast FDNF carrier operating on an FDNF yeah. model, but free to maneuver right. globally um, in addition of the, the continuous um, deterrent force that you would have. And we can't only focus on the Pacific. I mean, we do have to deal with right. you know, <laughs> increased <laughs> submarine activity in the North Atlantic. Right. We've got things in the Mediterranean. I mean, we have other places. Um, that, that we need to be and reasons we need to be there, but um, kind of without a strategy to justify that, add it up to how many ships does that right. make. Um, and, you know, one of the things that was different, you know, I found when kind of looking at how the, the current force structure assessments were developed was they went in with a premise, not only of the top line I talked right. about before, but they would be using a force generation model of the OFRP, yeah. of a five right. to make one. Well, if you go back to the 1980s maritime strategy, that's mm -hmm. not what it was. It was like 600 ships, you 15 carrier strike groups, mm -hmm. and they're all going to show right. up. Right. Um, you know, today when you look at the tip fit and you know how long it would take to get the number of carriers yeah. that presumably the O plans mm -hmm. would require, like we're not normally in a position to right. respond at that on that time right. schedule. Right, and, and <laughs> with so, the number of carriers that we would want. So. And, and so taking what you're talking about, you know, and, and applying it, 
you know, to the current situation. It seems like what you'd be arguing for is a little bit more specialized forces that are operating within particular regions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not the cookie cutter, one size fits all. It's not Carrier a strike, strike group, group leaves San Diego, to, deploys, right. loiters around Westpac for a little right. while. Maybe if the Reagan is doing their annual maintenance period, they stay a little longer, then they go to the Gulf, then they come back, and then they just do right. some you know, theater security collaboration hits of opportunity, port visits here or there, which yeah. of course they're going to do port visits right. if they're transiting, but it's not very deliberate in the right. sense. And I also think that, you know, if forces don't operate in an area and understand how their mm -hmm. adversary operates, yeah. then it's like the first time every time for yeah. them. So think about going on a deployment on a carrier and, um, or, you know, in, in a carrier strike group, and it's your first time on that deployment through the Strait of Hormuz. Mm -hmm. And so you do this brief, right? It's like the first time a ship has ever been through right. the Strait of Hormuz. We're going to get into Form 1. We're going to put the helicopter up. It's going to do this pattern, you know, and maybe some background, sometimes not. Well, the Omanis are going to call us here, and we're going to hear this at this point mm -hmm. in time. But you build that familiarity of right. what is a normal pattern of activity. Yeah. So if you're not there all the time, it's not normal to right. you, so you can't determine when something yeah. has shifted. Right, right. And so if you're on your 15th transit through the Strait of Hormuz on that deployment and something is mm -hmm. slightly different, you yeah, can you gather that, that. But if, you know, every single time a ship operates in one of these places in the Pacific, it's sort of like their first time right. there. Um, and there's not an institutional knowledge. And we don't really train for yeah. things like aggressive interactions mm -hmm. with ships. I mean, remember we used to do these ink sea procedures? Mm -hmm. right. And so for a long time, my first ship, we we'll put out of Japan. Occasionally, we would come in some range of a you know mm -hmm. Russian surface vessel, so we would pull that dust that off and <laughs> say the right things over the radio. But you know that was past the time of the Cold yeah. War, but it was still in effect. And then later on, we kind of when I was the XO on the cruiser, that became a thing that you trained to right. again because we were really encountering vessels more, and, and it was important. But like, we don't really have a codified, agreed upon way to interact with Chinese vessels at sea, right? Um, and so what is normal? What is aggressive? Are you leaving it up to the O5 CL out there on a DVG right. to make a decision that could actually lead, escalate inadvertently to, into something? So what I'm saying is that, that operating routinely, understanding right. the normal operations and pattern of the Chinese and all the other you know, entities, um, both, both military vessels and sort of the fishing and paramilitary and gray zone type thing, mm -hmm. If, if I think if our forces don't have the ability to be gain the familiarity with that, right, th that can inadvertently lead to problems. Which, which operating on this more of an FDNF model, getting that more frequent deployment, and then having you know more posture, basically some more forward base and report station of forces mm -hmm. in that theater is going to help you do that. Which, okay. which is that deterrence force idea. Um, other questions, um, Brent Sadler. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you again for uh, having me, and it's great seeing you again. Yeah, I'm good to see you, Brent. Uh, I wanted to come to, in, in your article, you talk about deterrence, and there's deterrence by denial and deterrence by punishment, but deterrence is, there's conventional and there's strategic, but they're all about deterring war. And the Chinese and the Russians are definitely in, involved in a conflict with us below the threshold of conflict. Mm -hmm. and, and they're winning ground and they're changing realities in the status quo. In your engagements with Navy leadership, uh, what is your sense about what they view, and, and, it, and also your assessment, is it appropriate, the right balance between being an active participant and competitor in that peacetime? Some of it's the gray zone, but it's also, you kind of, I really like when you're talking about port visits and there's an economic diplomatic aspect of that. The right balance between what we design the fleet to do in the deterrence mm -hmm. versus the right amount of balance and emphasis on competing in that peacetime competition with the Chinese and the Russians. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to reflect back on, you know, conversations that I've had recently with um, leadership on that. And, you know, I think that if we look at everything, if just say, like, the simple fact is if a budget is a reflection of your values, they're really trying to win the high-end fight, mm -hmm. and they're not putting a lot of resources in the low-end fight and the things that could create a lot of value for a lot less money and could be developed a lot more quickly. So most of my answers have been long, but I think I'll keep that one short. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and arguably, um, China and Russia are not looking for the high-end fight. They would love to threaten the high-end fight as a tool, but it, they clearly are willing to accept mm -hmm. a little bit longer effort that gets them what they want with less risk and, mm -hmm. and less violence. Yeah, I mean, it's, no, it's not to anyone's benefit to right. escalate this, right? right? right. But 
um, you know, I but think you have to have the, the tools Chinese to be able have to avoid the escalation. Long term vision, yeah. and they have done the things that they right. said they were going to do over decades. Uh, and they've got the tools to operate at that level. They've been using you know, the maritime militia, the Coast Guard. That they've got the kind of forces that allow them to operate on those lower rungs of the escalation ladder. And we don't, so we end up having to jump up every time we, you know, have a confrontation mm -hmm. with but them. But we could if we made it a priority. Yeah, definitely. Which would be an element of a strategy. I mean, that's a clear element. Of a strategy. I let you say it. I don't want to sound like a broken record. Can I just follow up on? So on that, is there an insti is there an institutional cultural kind of impediment that's kind of keeps the Navy fixated on that high end fight? Or they have is to justify it else? their budget. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I truly think it is that is just continuously what it is is coming back and having to justify the budget instead of having a strategy in which to be able to face that off of. I mean, and I feel that, you know, from my perspective in the House, like, you know, they come to us this year with a budget that only has one DDG in it. And you, you kind of, before you find yourself actually in this role, always hear, you know, well, they'll do these games where they might request right. one thing, but they really want something else, and then they make Congress add it back. But don't leave it up to Congress to make these decisions for you. I mean, the Navy needs to take their reins and, and come to us with what they actually want and need. And I feel like it is, it, this was probably to me, like, one of the most obvious shell games because the only ship that we can build right now on time, on budget, with reliability is a DDG. And you're going to come and say, China's our biggest threat. We need to do everything we possibly can. But oh, by the way, we only want to build one destroyer this year. I mean, why aren't you building four? You know? Um, so it is, um, that is a little frustrating because then they're just leaving it to us to put the stuff back. Um, and then, you know, I think you probably saw the, the Senate, the SAS, you know, recently went through mm -hmm. their version of the NDA and they upped the top line, which I have advocated for since the beginning and will continue to advocate for through this process. But they added $25 billion and they just decided what they wanted for the mm -hmm. reasons they wanted it. It wasn't based off of a strategy. It wasn't necessarily based off the highest priority needs of any of the services. It was really just left up to Congress to do it. And so, I mean, going back to my discussion before, if there was a strategy, it was clearly, you know, grounded in, in what the services needed, and essentially in this case we're talking about the Navy, um, and there was an opportunity to say, well, we need to add $25 billion to the budget this year, it would be really clear what that needed to be. Uh, yeah, and if they had a strategy, even if they came in with a budget that was fiscally constrained, you know, they had a strategy, but then they said, I'm gonna, we're going to keep with this 704 top line or whatever, um, and have a limited number of ships in the budget, then at least Congress would have an idea of where to start going to add back in rather than just going to the unfunded priority lists and saying, okay, that's all I've got to go on. It seems like a strategy would at least inform that decision making, even if the administration chose to not fully fund that strategy. Uh, uh, Eric Labs. Uh, Eric Labs, Congressional Budget <laughs> Office. Nice to see you again. Nice Carol. to see you. Um, I want to go, you started touching on my, where my question was going to go, because I wanted to push back maybe just a little mm -hmm. bit on, on the early part of the conversation. I, I agree that a budget without a strategy just leads to incoherence. At the same time, a strategy without some sort of uh, understanding or context of resources, I think of it as sort of a dialectic with sort of what your resources are. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a strategy without some sort of reference to resources leads to, well, where is, you know, what's the cap? How do you say is enough? Well, I, I need 15 aircraft carriers. No, well, there's no, there's no budget, so there's no cap, so well, actually let's make it 20 to be really safe. Or next guy will say, well, I'll make it 22 if you really want to be safe. So where is it in, in your vision of this, that dialectic that needs to occur between goals and resor resources, which to, me, to my mind is what strategy is ultimately supposed to do for you? Right. And so I wouldn't imply that, you know, this strategy should come in just completely unbounded and saying like, okay, well, if we could, if we could have everything we wanted, we'd have 50 aircraft carriers, we'd build another 100 cruisers and, you know, 200 destroyers. I mean, you're right that there does have to, it has to be grounded in reality, like of the force structure, the force size, what the industrial base can support. I mean, we all know that constraints of the ship maintenance and repair industrial base um, has led to some of these, you know, uh, lengthy mm -hmm. maintenance periods which have prevented deployments, which have then, you know, it's been like a cascading effect of, you know, effectively reduced the size of the fleet because the maintenance can't get done on time. Um, you know, so I, it is a very good question um, to say, you know, there has to be bounds of within reason, but, you know, with, I think you have to go back to like, what are your goals? And I think that, you know, at a couple hearings this year, um, Secretary of the Army, the Chairman um, as well, 
came in and they said, like, you know, we're coming with this budget because we're going to continue to build a force that's going to fight and win. And so then I, I think it was the Secretary of the Army in that hearing. I said, well, Mr. No, the, no, sorry, the Chief of Staff of the Army. I said, well, what does that mean to you to win? Like, what is winning with China? And, and so then that was really a whole other discussion, is winning somehow maintaining right. the status quo. Right. There's always some friction. You know, the Chinese are kind of always trying to have this influence in the South China Sea. You know, but, but we're basically doing our job of maintaining, you know, sea lines of yep. communication, freedom of navigation, you know, trade, and, and, and um, you know, keeping it below that threshold mm -hmm. of any sort of actual conflict. Um, so I, I think, you know, it even goes back to a question of, like, what is our objective? If, if, you know, they're coming in and saying this is going to provide a force that can fight and win, like, actually it's not, you know, mm -hmm. because there's the technology issues, there's the size of the force issue, there's all kinds of things. Like, this is not the force that's going to fight and win, so at least start by being realistic about the fact that okay, this is the force that could deter and maintain the status quo for the time being. Um, and if you wanted to get to some other next goal, like you set some metrics of, you know, so what do you want to achieve? Do you want to stop the Chinese from building any more artificial features um, that they're going to then arm? Like we just kind of let them do that. They said they were going to do it. We're like, I'm not sure they're really going to do that. But they, you know, they built islands the size of with airfields and, and then armed them. Um, and we didn't really, we didn't stop them. We didn't really protest them doing it. Um, and now they continue to make these, you know, a, these um, maritime claims that we don't recognize. So, I mean, at some point, we, we we have to draw a line. And the longer we don't draw a line, the line that we draw could be much harder to, to hold. Right. Um, so I, it wasn't a perfect answer to your question, but we haven't defined what we want to do. So I think, you know, it is kind of going back to, like, starting with a strategy, you know, even at the, the highest levels of government, like, what is our strategy? And then distilling that down to, like, what is the role of, the Navy, and really all naval forces, because I, I think we should stop just looking <laughs> at the Navy. I think right. we have other resources. I think we have you know, the rest of our maritime industry, the lack of US flag vessels. That's a vulnerability. The Coast Guard can do more. I mean, there's just a lot more that we could be doing with other resources than just the Navy as well in this in this domain. Yeah, which would be a maritime strategy. I mean, yeah, I think full arguably, maritime strategy. you know, just like and not even just the, a naval strategy, but right. a full encompassing maritime strategy, which I'm, I understand, you know, there was attempts at developing, yes. yep, there were. but that really has never Well, the, And the challenge was coming up with a goal and coming up with some objectives that people could agree to that were sharp, mm -hmm. you know, defined enough to be able to, to develop a plan around. Mm -hmm. um, and in the fleet architecture study, what we did was we built out that strategy and then the resulting force structure and then figured out what the cost is going to be and then said, okay, well, that's realistic. It's reasonable to say we could argue for that much money and then if it could scale down. If, if you don't get that much money, that strategy still holds, even if within some constrained fiscal environment. And then at a certain point, it breaks. Mm -hmm. But you know, like you said, it's a dialectic. You have to go back and forth between those two. Yeah. Um, Tony Capaccio. Hi, ma'am. I'm Tony Capaccio with Bloomberg News. A couple things. The most often repeated comment in the last five months has been China has a larger Navy than the US Navy. What are some of the caveats to that statement? And two. Where does the U.S. Navy have a clear advantage over China right now? Because you hear all this and you wonder, really, do, do we have any advantage over the Chinese Navy? Um, so, I mean, the numbers are the numbers. Um, you know, and they are growing the size of their Navy faster than we are, and they have more ships than we do, and that's not even counting all of these kind of non-Navy naval vessels, like, you know, their um, maritime militia and their fishing vessels that they use, you know, um, like happened what a few. Are the well, I mean, think about this. So you had what over a hundred of these fishing vessels go anchor in this reef in the Philippines, Whitsun Reef, and you know they're always testing um, these these other nations and what they're going to do. And we have a mutual defense treaty with the Philippines. So by doing these things, they're testing us. So, you know, everybody's focused on, like, China's going to invade Taiwan, which, of course, you know, is kind of the major thing. We think, like, oh, that's going to happen. But this could start in all kinds of places if for all kinds of reasons, like, you know, the, the, the fishing vessels, all kinds of fishing claims, all kinds of disputed maritime claims with diff a variety of different nations and different geographic areas um, where they're both laying claim to some different features or islands. Um, it could happen, you know, over passage of 
different, you know, just commercial maritime vessels in different areas. You know, so one thing that clicked um, for me, and I'll go back to your question again, was like, so when the Ever Given got stuck in the Suez Canal, I thought to myself, well, like a lot of people around the world, they don't look a lot at maritime choke points, you know, at the Naval Academy, like in reef points, right? You got to memorize all the choke points. So you ask people if they even know what a choke point is, they would probably come up with the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal, but you know, not a lot of other ones necessarily off the top of their head. Um, but, you know, seeing the ship stuck in the Suez Canal after you got past the point of memes and things people were putting online, you see this is a novel thing, this enormous ship. And you, if you've been in the Suez Canal, you know, every ship looks gigantic compared to this very narrow canal. Um, the fact that the, the vulnerability of choke points, and not only that, but China wants to essentially create their own choke points. I mean, they want to make the entire South China Sea a series of choke points that they control by building up these features, which we don't recognize as islands, disputed maritime claims, ac activity there that would prevent and disrupt the passage of merchant traffic unless you know sanctioned by them through this area. And then the Russians in the Arctic, the same thing. You know, so we literally have the Chinese and the Russians who want to essentially create new choke points. Um, and not only that, but the Chinese have positioned themselves in a variety of ways at every major choke point in the world. Um, their overseas Navy base that they built in Djibouti is at the Bab al-Mandeb, the entrance to the Red Sea. They've now expanded the pier there to operate their carrier out of there. And it's an incredibly strategic point to be um, geographically. They have an interest in both ends of mm -hmm. the Panama Canal. Um, and they've tried to position themselves in port facilities around the world so that, you know, I mean, the, the interruption of the flow of trade and these geographic maritime choke points um, are ways that they can disrupt that are not just one-on-one, -on -one, like, naval vessel versus naval vessel capability range of missiles or aircraft, right? Um, and then you ask, where do we clearly have an advantage? We clearly have an advantage with submarines um, over the Chinese, I think. And that, you know, the investment that we continue to make in our submarine fleet is incredibly important. Um, I think that although they have nuclear submarines, their ability to deploy out of area with nuclear submarines is, is well behind ours. Their quantity is well behind ours. And so I think that that, that is an area where we maintain a, a clear advantage. And, you know, even the, the, there's vulnerability of coming within the first island chain carrier strike group operations and the range of their different missiles um, against our forces. But, you know, they don't have the same ability, you know, with their carrier to operate the way we operate our carriers, generate sorties and, and do the power projection role that we have. I mean, but, but our range has cut back. I mean, if you think of even in the 1980s maritime strategy, the range that we had just from our carrier-based aircraft was more than what it is today. And we really have no carrier launch, you know, air-to-surface missile, long-range air-to-surface missile capability right now either. We just... We haven't prioritized these types of systems. I think the technology is within the realm of what we mm -hmm. can do, even what we used to do mm -hmm. on some platforms. But we haven't made them priorities. And I don't feel like coming back to this budget without a real strategy that they've been emphasized as priorities either. I asked the um, chief of staff of the Air Force during the hearing that we had recently about you know, the, the Air Force acquiring this long-range anti-surface missile. And so I basically said, well, how many of these are you acquiring? And what's your goal? And what would be a good number to sort of be a game changer in the Pacific? And also, what about mine laying capability? You know, if the Air Force can do a couple things that are relatively inexpensive and game changers in the Pacific, they, they could, those are two things they could do. And neither of those were really kind of on his radar of things that he came to the hearing specifically to address. So, um, you know, I, to answer your question, um, you know, the Chinese are outpacing us in shipbuilding. They're catching up with us in capability. They're exceeding us in weapon ranges and, and certain types of weapons. But, you know, I think we still have a clear advantage in submarines. Um, and our ability to operate in coordinated operations at long distances from home. But they have the home field advantage. They don't have to deploy all the way across the Pacific. Just, you know, they're in the defensive posture mode, and we, we have to go so far to even get there. Yeah, yeah definitely. And, and to your earlier point, it, it raises the question of what kinds of scenarios should we be preparing for? What should we prioritize in, in the strategy? You know, so it's not just China, China Taiwan. Um, and sometimes I think, at least from the analysis we've done, the China-Taiwan scenario tends to skew your capability priorities substantially. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, if it turns out it's unwinnable, you know, as Admiral or as, as General Hyten mentioned uh, last week, you, it may incentivize people to make just arbitrary choices. If the, if the fact is you can't win that scenario no matter what, well, then it doesn't really matter what you choose. And you can start making choices based on parochial interests as opposed to what gets you the best result out of that scenario. So scenarios end up being an interesting thing to, to bring up. So Megan. One more question. Megan. Hi. 
Hi, Megan Eckstein with Defense News. Um, this may get back to some of your Goldwater Nichols comments, but I wondered with the maritime strategy, who you think should write it and who you think should be obligated to follow it? Uh, because it seemed, you know, you mentioned that the CNO gives a strategy that's budget constrained. Um, if you go to the, co the COCOMs, they're going to give you something wildly unaffordable. And it almost feels like neither matters because we've had several secretaries of defense in a row who have been prioritizing carriers in the Middle East even though that's not in line with the most recent national defense strategy. So I wonder who actually should write this and who should have to follow it, kind of how you envision um, this mm -hmm. playing out. Yeah, so I mean, this does go back to the Goldwater Nichols discussion. I mean, because actually, like, under the current law, the Navy really can't write a strategy that would be, you know, followed and implemented um, because nothing is done as a service. It's actually done jointly, and, um, you know, the, the different strategy roles reside with the joint staff operational plans and theater specific ones reside with the combatant commanders um, you know so I think that that is really one of the things that I I want to focus on long-term legislatively like how do we fix this problem that was caused by Goldwater Nichols and you know I've kind of looked at it as a long-term project I mean I know that this has been debated in the past there have been congressional hearings about it I understand the late Senator McCain you know, it was was really kind of focusing in on starting some some work uh, forward on you know reform and changes to Goldwater Nichols, and so kind of my thought process is this is like a four six year type thing. I think it takes discussions like this. I think it takes a lot of smart people who can like, focus <laughs> on this full time, um, to, you know, to provide the types of suggestions I think to to the current legislation and and figure out you know did it go too far? Did it not go far enough? Um, and there. I have thoughts on both, but I, I, my current opinion is I think it went too far um, in consolidating the, all the power within the chairman. Um, mm -hmm. And just to give one anecdote of why I think that is I recently asked a variety of people who would be aware of this information, you know, has the Indo-PACOM commander Aquilino briefed the president? You would think as the combatant commander in the theater where we're focusing the most and we, the president sent over a budget, over $700 billion to spend to defend our country against the threat in the Pacific, that the Indo-PACOM commander would have briefed the president. And my understanding is that like, he hasn't done that directly. So that is an indication to me of, you know, it went too far because we've put these layers in there that prevent, you know, that type of thing from happening. Um, so it is a big problem for us to solve, and I view it as really a, you know, two, four, I mean, they, they, get, they kind of, this time frame, a two, four, six year mm -hmm. thing, and Brent and I have had these conversations about this before, is that, you know, I think that, that there's sort of the conversation phase of like what, identifying what's wrong, there's the hearing phase of bringing that before Congress and, and really like laying it out, and then the following Congress, there's the legislative phase of let's you know write this into law to, to make these fixes. But it, I don't think it's something we can solve overnight. Um, and and the, the point of your question, I think, exactly is, is that it, it doesn't reside anywhere under the current law for that to happen. Yeah. So Megan ends us on a high note. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, Congressman uh, Elaine Luria, thank you very much for yeah, being here with us tonight. Really appreciate uh, your insight uh, and your efforts on, the, on behalf of the Naval Services. I, I mean, I think we, we need more members of Congress that have served. Uh, I think that's improving, but we clearly need more members that are thinking, thought, you know, thinking carefully about how we develop the force of the future and deal with the challenges of today. So thank you very much for being here tonight uh, and participating. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. <laughs> uh, and uh, thank you all for being here, uh, and we appreciate your, uh, your attendance at this uh, first public event in a long time. Uh, so thank you from the Hudson Institute. Until next time. <laughs>